Lord, we thank you for your word tonight. Lord, I pray you help me speak with the oracles of God. Lord, I pray you give people ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Lord, I pray to bear fruit in their lives, 30, 60, 100 fold. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? Sheol and Abaddon lie open before the Lord. How much more human hearts? Even hell holds no secrets from God. Do you think he can't read human hearts? It's funny, everybody thinks they're always hiding something from God. <laughs> you know, and then when you say it like this, you're like, well, of course, I really don't know that, but really, you know. Well, you know that one thing that you know you're, that God's been working on you on not to feel that way about? He already knows. He's already, he's just waiting on you to figure out what the Word says and act accordingly. You know, I mean, there's like nobody in this room, I know, I know there's nobody that's got upset with somebody within the last few weeks and really know they were supposed to walk in forgiveness and they held on to that for a little while longer until the Holy Spirit made them really uncomfortable. I know nobody in it because God didn't see that. I... <laughs> but you acted like He did. You know what? Hell, my wife talks about how uh, she she talked me up real big the other day at the other church. I told her I told her it was going to cost me when we left there. How much going to have to pay? <laughs> you know, one of the things that's helped me be honest with people and honest with myself was realizing that uh, God. It, it became kind of freeing realizing God already knew everything. I might as well go ahead and own up to it and deal with it. If you don't really realize that, you'll keep trying to hide things and put things off and twist them around thinking you're getting by with something. When you start realizing that there's nothing withhold from God, there's nothing He don't see, and listen, He's already looking and seeing the motive behind why you did it. Not even what you did, He knows why you did it. You're even telling yourself another story and He's like, that's not the same story your heart's singing. <laughs> but, so you can see where either if you kept trying to operate in delusion, that, that word can kind of maybe bring you a little down, be a little corrective, but if you're operating, realizing that the repentance is the gateway to freedom, you'll start realizing, he already knows everything anyways, why hold on to any of this junk? Why don't I just unload? Amen? Some of you are looking at me like, okay, Pastor. She hold and abandon are before Jehovah, how much more then the hearts of the children of men? She hold and abandon lie open before the Lord, how much more the hearts of the children of men? She hold and abandon are before Yahweh, how much more than the hearts of the children of men? Not even the world of the dead can keep the Lord from knowing what is there. How then can we hide our thoughts from God? Has anybody ever tried to hide their thoughts from God? You do, I didn't do it. Yeah, you only try. I mean, even like you know, sometimes, you know, some people, the pastor will ask you how you're doing, you'll say this, and he'll kind of look at you like you know he knows, but you don't want to deal with it. And then you really think that God, you know, who do you think told pastor? God. He already knew. So I just want you to, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to put a nugget in that, that frees you up. Instead of trying to hold things, realize you might as well go ahead and unload it all and get free from it anyways. Because He already knows. I mean, some of you right now, you had specific things that jumped in your head. He, you doing all right? You're like, well... I don't know. How much should I say? <laughs> what does he know? I'm going to see what he does. <laughs> and then you'll try to feel it out to see if I'm in the same place. I mean, you don't want to give up nothing. You know, you don't have to give up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And now you're realizing that I already knew and God already knew all along. And the only reason why I knew is because He already knew and He told me. I don't know nothing if He don't tell me. So just go ahead and get rid of it anyways. But sometimes we like to hold on to stuff. 
We like to make problems our pets. You get comfortable with them. They're yours. I have a right to feel this way. I'm going to hold on to this till things turn around. I ain't nothing going to turn around until you hold on and you let go of it. And here's the other thing. If, if we weren't all susceptible, susceptible to falling into this, there wouldn't be a whole verse in the Word of God about telling you that God knows what's going on. Because He knew sometime you'd be over there trying to... You know, and the darker the secret, the more you try to hide it before the record. The more shameful you think it is, the more you'll try to bury it down. And the more the enemy will try to keep you bound by it. I don't want nobody to ever know. You know. And there's things that I, I'm not proud of, you know, and I'm definitely not. And I'm so thankful God washed me in the blood of the Lamb. But I've been surprised sometimes through the year I gave my testimony, people come back like I, I, I mean, that I, I murdered, raped, and pillaged three villages, you know, and I'm like, well, I was bad, but I don't know, you know, God doesn't look at bad. I can just tell you, in my own eyes, I was bad. But uh, I wasn't that bad. But, you know, when, when I got married, and before I asked my bride to come one with me, there was a time when it was really risky for me because everybody had always left me, everybody had kind of betrayed me of that in my life and, I, and God told me you got to be honest with her and God told me he said you got to be honest with her she needs to know what she's getting into she needs to know the stuff you ain't talked to me about I'm like well Lord can I trust her and he said no but you can trust me now he did not mean it nothing against him. and so I said I, I understand that God and so I set her aside <coughs> before we said I do and I told her these things and I fully expected her to, to say, I'm done. I'm out of here. And she said, that's okay, it's under the blood. And I said, say what? <laughs> What'd you say? She said, well, that's in the past. You ain't like that way no more. And I said, well, no. She said, you better not. <laughs> Why am I saying Because no, the enemy likes to take your secrets and make you ashamed of them. He likes to beat you up, and God wants you to set you free from them. And the first thing, you, sometimes the hardest thing is facing them. And then just letting God, then, then that way you can truly go to God. You know, we've asked for forgiveness for our sin, but there's certain ones that I felt like I had to go to God. I said, God, you remember this? He said, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Lord, you said you were washing me clean. Yeah, I washed me clean. Lord, can you, just, can you just free me from that? In Jesus' name, and you'll be shocked at the feeling you'll get and the freedom you'll get from that. And I've learned that no matter how long I serve God, there could be. How, how many have ever had the enemy trick you? And, and I listen, I, I'm going to tell you that if you tricked you, it was because you probably had an open doorway. And I'm not going to preach a whole thing on overcomers, and you all know about open doorways. Okay, so I'm not just saying, oh, poor me, the devil deceived me, and I tripped and fell into a mess. We all know that it's a process. But have you ever, has he ever got to a place and then you're ashamed to even tell anybody, especially if you've been serving God? Especially if you're on fire for God, you know? He, he gets you run around something you don't want to tell nobody. Because, I mean, that's going to that's gonna ruin your image. You know what's going to ruin your image? Hidden sin. You know what's going to ruin who you are? Holding that thing inside because it will become a cesspool inside you. It will become a weight. And listen, God already knows. And listen, it said, confess your sins one to another that you may be forgiven. You don't got to tell anybody else. You may need to go talk to your pastor. And if you ain't got a pastor that you can confide in, I know he's not talking to nobody else, you need to get a new pastor. Anyways, that's but if you uh, that's for all you online <laughs> but you know God already knows and sometimes I want you to stop and think because there's something in your heart in your spirit that you've been too ashamed to even talk about that you've never even really brought it before the throne room of God to get true You've already got forgiveness for it, but you've never truly brought it to get it washed clean. Because listen, you don't have to name every sin. When you say, God, forgive me, He meant it. He let you. He set you free from all of it. You don't have to name. But you've had something that the enemy tries to bring up and haunt you with. That you need to come. God already knows. Instead of trying to bury that thing in shame, you need to bring it before the throne room of grace and say, Lord, your blood is sufficient for this thing. Lord, I, you know what this happened, and God, you see it. Just wash it clean. You'll be surprised at the freedom that comes from it.
Amen. Everybody here, Pastor, and I, and he knows it all anyways. You know, the next time the enemy tries to talk to you about some deep, dark secret that he's going to tell everybody, say, well, the one that matters already knows it all. <laughs> He'll shut up real quick. That was free. Verse 12, A scorner loveth not one that reproveth him, neither will he go unto the wise. A mocker doesn't love one who corrects him. He will not consult the wise. Know-it-alls don't like being told what to do. They avoid the company of wise men and women. And I can tell you, if you want to make a fool mad, just try to tell, just try to give him some loving correction. Matter of fact, the Bible says, God told me a long time ago, people don't care what you have to say until they know that you care. And you're not going to you're not going to be able to sit or speak wisdom to somebody that's not wanting to receive anything. All you can do is love on them, to get enough anointing around them, and start breaking some things free. Because they're going to argue with you, they're going to spit on you, they're going to make a mockery of you, and it's not worth your time. It's not worth your anointing. You need to shake the dust off your feet and and realize that they're until God gets a hold of them, they're going to argue with the signpost. And they'll avoid it. And listen, when you. I remember years past, I'd be like, I want to get around certain people. And you'll notice they don't want to go around. How many, how many of you, when you got somebody, you don't, you don't even even told me this, you've got somebody, you, they've been a real handful, and you've been trying to get them to come talk to a pastor, and they act like I'm the player. <laughs> they like, I ain't going to talk to him. <laughs> A scoffer loveth not to be reproved. Imagine that. He will not go unto the wise. I mean, you ever seen a dog that don't want to go somewhere? They put their feet down. You can tug them on a collar. They ain't going. That's what it's like somebody that's a scoffer, a know-it-all, trying to take them to the wise. Or like a dog got their feet planted. They're just dragging them. They ain't going nowhere. A scoffer does not like to be reproved. Now listen, there's a difference I'm, I'm going I'm to give you something here. See, I've never met very many people that like to be corrected, but until you learn to receive correction, you're always going to be a scoffer or a scorner. There's either one or other. A scoffer does not like to be reproved. He will not go to the wise. A scoffer doesn't love to be reproved. He will not go to the wise. Conceited people do not like to be corrected. Pride comes before the fall. I miss so many people. They just they, they know everything. They tell you how it all goes, and they never ask for advice from those that know. I mean, I mean, you know, people uh, from those who are wiser. You ever know that? You ever been around people that know it all and they never ask for advice, even though they should be the first ones asking? And I learned in my life that, you know what, even if I feel like I've got a, a good handle on it, if somebody wants to share with me, I'm not going to shut them down. I'm going to listen. There may be something there I can learn from, grow from, grasp from. And uh, realizing that I don't know it all, there's only one guy that does, and his name's Jesus. And even... If I know everything this person's trying to share with me, bless their heart, and maybe they're even a little conceited, if I listen to them, I've just softened their heart a little bit. I didn't have to tell them, oh, I already knew all that and make them feel little inside themselves because all it does is show how little I was in the first place. All I got to do is say, hey, thanks for sharing. Amen. So a scorner is the same as a conceited people and a know-it-all. Now, we all, whenever I think of know-it-all, usually most people think of the extremes. You know, that person that's worked, to, you get to them, they, they work, they've been doing this job for 50 years, they're 28, and, you know, they've got 40 years' experience, and, and they can tell you how to build a rocket ship, do everything else under the sun, but they're still living at home in their mom's basement. You know? <laughs> but they can tell you how about finance and all those things. There's nothing wrong living in your mom's basement, I would guess. Well, there is a change. Yes, there is. Anyways. <laughs> Lord help. The Holy Ghost will make you tell the truth all the time. <laughs> 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 
But listen, if you get nothing else, just say, I'm not going to be a know-it-all or conceited, and to, to not be one, then I need to be somebody that's willing to listen to correction. Now, I don't, I, I've met very few people in my life that are like, yay, I love correction time. <laughs> but I've met few, and, and I, I, I am one of them. I don't like it when it comes, you know, but I pay attention because I like pain even less. And if I don't want pain, I, if, I, if I receive the correction, it's going to it's going to keep me from a whole lot more pain. A merry heart make a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. How do we know God wants you to be happy? Romans fifteen thirteen says He's the God of hope, and He'll fill you with all joy and peace through the power of the Holy Ghost. He says the joy of the Lord is your strength. You know what happens when you get full of joy? You, you laugh. You smile. You laugh at things that aren't even funny. You just, you know, you ha, 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 ha. Ain't that right, Rachel? You just go, ha, 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 ha. It's up here. He'll get back there in a minute. Because... A joy, you know what? Your countenance is your face. I've had so many people say, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I've been walking in power of God. I can't even make my face look like a little power of God Almighty all my life. I've been serving God 40 years, bless God. Tell your face. If you've been with, you know, when, when it says when, when Moses came down, he said his face, his countenance shone. They could tell that something was going on. And he said there wasn't one feeble one among them. They were full of joy and dancing. When David got in the presence of God, he danced and most of his clothes fell off. And said, I don't care. I'm just happy to be with Jesus. Do you know it should still be that way today? Now listen, I know we all go through times. We go through things. But you get to decide what kind of heart you have. You get to decide what you grow and don't grow. Another one is a joyful heart makes a face cheerful. If you need, if you ever want to see a face cheerful, you ever seen a cheerful face? I mean, that's happy. You know, I know lots of people who do fake grins. Oh, bless your heart. I'm like, that's the plastic thing I ever seen. But when you're happy, people can tell. My kids, bless her, they bless me. They're so funny. I'll be trying to be serious and I'll be trying not to show them nothing and they've got to, they, they know me, they'll look real close. It's like, Daddy, you got that one little turn on top of your, your, your little smile. I can see you're, you're kidding. I'm like, I can't even fool, I, I can't fool them anymore. The only way I can fool them is if my heart's not happy. And then they know. <laughs> he is upset. There is no joking going on. But a sad heart produces a broken spirit. See, because when you let your heart get sad, it becomes, it becomes broken throughout your whole body. Nothing works right. Your spirit is broken. But I'm so thankful there's still a bomb in Gilead. Luke 4.18 says he came to heal the broken heart. Listen, he knew there'd be times when you'd be broken. He said, but I've got a bomb for that. I've got a sand to put on that heart. I'll get you back. I'll get you your container all fixed up so we can get you some joy in there. Some of you are getting it. Some of you are just letting it go by. That's your bad. A cheerful heart brings a smile to your face. See, if you want to know if you've been spending time with God, just get up and look in the mirror. If it ain't smiling, then you need to go back in the prayer closet. You need to pray through till you get somewhere. You need to give some talk to God. Maybe you need to come clean on something. I don't know, but you need to get back in there because you ain't you can't face your day without being full of the Holy Ghost. What's that? I rebuke that in Jesus' name. You cannot. A glad heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit was broken. Listen, the enemy, he came, he came to steal, kill, and destroy. He'll break your heart any chance he can get over anything he can get. But we have one that came to heal our broken heart. And see, hey, 
notice it didn't just say when your heart's happy, it says it'll shine out to your outside. It'll come out your mouth. You ever, been around, you, you ever notice when you go to walk into some place when somebody's been with God and they're just smiling and you're like, or maybe, you know, you can walk into a meeting, you know, they're there and you can feel the presence of God. And all of a sudden, all the cares of life start fading off of you. Do you know that's what God wants for us every single day? Now there's an enemy in your soul that's fighting hard to keep you from going in there. But I'm telling you, there's a place that, you, you know, a long time ago, I said, well, God, I want to be full of the Holy Ghost. I want to be so full of the Holy Ghost. I want, be, I want to see your glory. I want to see your glory. And I still pray those things. He said, well, first you need to get into joy. If you want to see my glory, then, then when you spend time with me, then it should be able to show on your face, your countenance. And it, this was during the season where I was working with a lot of rough people, and I didn't feel like smiling. And there's days still yet, when, you know, dealing with just life things that I get, find myself, I look in the mirror and I'm like, you look like you're sucking on persimmons, but you need to go have a Jesus talk. And I go get alone with God. And then guess what? My countenance starts changing. A heart makes a cheerful face. Everybody like cheerful faces? When you walk into a to a place of business, if somebody's smiling genuinely at you, or if they're scrowling, you already made up your mind what kind of business you're going to do in that establishment. Amen. Do you realize that you're the establishment of Jesus Christ upon the face of the earth? You're his poster child. And some people are going to make up their mind what they're going to do with it, but when they first look at you, now listen, I, I'm not telling you you're going to be on target 24-7. You're going to have rough days. That's why there's a bomb in Gilead. That's why he came to heal the brokenhearted. Sometimes you're going to have to go apply the salve. You're going to have to get your heart healed up, but you should not be in a perpetual place of being down in the dumps and being brokenhearted. You should be in a place where you're ready to help others and put some salve on them. And you can't give something you ain't got. You tell anybody, bless Jesus, he's the best thing that ever happened to me. I'm so happy. And they're like, tell your face. <laughs> I'm reading it from the word. I'm not, you know, there's not a, you can't even misquote it. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is crushed. You know? And there's another scripture I preached out of many times that says, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But see, because God is a God of hope, He is hope, He can never be stopped. You can confidently anticipate the things of God to come to pass. So there will be times and seasons in your life that hope is deferred. There will be things that you've prayed for, you've stood in faith for, they won't come to pass. And you'll be like, God, where are you at? And your hope's deferred. But He said, when they come, they're a tree of life. Because from then on, your roots will go down. And that thing that the enemy tried to challenge you in no longer be affected because you'll have roots that will go down deep into the joy stream. And you'll go, Woo, praise God. God was with me then. He'll be with me now. And it'll become a tree of life into you. But you'll go through seasons where your hope will be deferred. And that's when you need to go along with God and fill up with the Holy Ghost. David went and encouraged himself. He prayed. He saw him. Nobody else was going to say anything about it. He wouldn't remind it of himself of what God did. You'll find yourself in places that you may be the only one there. And you're going to have to go and encourage yourself in the Lord and get full of the Holy Ghost. A glad heart makes a cheerful face, but an aching heart breaks the spirit. And I'll share just one other tidbit. I've done a lot of funerals in my life. I don't like doing any of them, but I'd much rather do someone that's made heaven because there's a whole other atmosphere in the room. When you do someone's funeral that didn't make heaven, there's a breaking and a grieving in that room that only God can fix, and most of, the, most of them are reaching out for God to touch them. When people are happy, they smile. Can you make it any more plainer than that? <laughs> But when they are sad, they look depressed. Now, God wants us to be happy, full of joy, right? Full of power, full of the Holy Ghost. And I just, if you take nothing away, away from this, just know when you look in the mirror, 
Your face ain't lying to you. You know, nobody's around then, and God already knows what's going on inside you. So when you look in the mirror, your face ain't lying. And let me tell you, I've had a lot of come to Jesus moments in the mirror. But like, you ain't going out looking like that. <laughs> you need to get your act. You comb your hair, you brush your teeth before you go. You need to get your spirit man hair combed just right before you leave the house, too. <laughs> you need to get that Holy Ghost joy on. You may need to get, so well, I'm having a hard time, Pastor. You may need to get up, to work, or up, up, up for work an hour early so you can pray and pray in the Holy Ghost and read your word so that you got your face, get your game face on before you leave the house. You might need to turn the TV off at night or turn something else off so you can pray in the Holy Ghost for about an hour and get that spirit man charged back up. You may maybe need to start praying in the Holy Ghost with the kids driving down the road. You'll do it enough, they'll just become used to it. That is say, oh, he, he was praying. We got quiet. We, we know what happens then. We just went quiet. True story. Yeah. He, he's a great. Because you can't help you. We live in the world. We're not of the world. And things are going to happen. But we have a bomb in Gilead. We have one that, who, whose heart, the whole spirit of God encourages, changes us. He's full of joy and peace. When you're full of the Holy Ghost, you're full of joy and peace. And if you're not, then you're drowning and you need to pray in the Holy Ghost. The Bible says build up yourself praying in the Holy Ghost. Build up your faith. Why? Because it's a supernatural thing coming out of you. And joy starts coming. You start believing in the impossible again. The impossible becomes possible. You'll get happy. And when you get happy, people start going, why are you happy? You have every reason to be depressed. Why are you not mad and upset? What's going on in you? Well, it's the Holy Ghost. It'll change you. And if you've never experienced it, I encourage you to experience it. There is nothing like it. And if you're only experiencing it once a week, I want to tell you, you can have it every day. Every day. How many like being happy? Is anybody here opposed to being happy? If you are, we first need to pray for you. <laughs> yeah, everybody likes being happy, right? Everybody likes being full of joy. I mean, you know, you. I, I years ago when I was in the world, even after as a young believer, I just thought, well, you got good days, you got bad days. You just gotta learn to roll with all the days. I'm gonna tell you that'll lead you down to a to a to a, a spiritual place of just. A, Bond in, in bondage, because you're just taking whatever the enemy throws at you and trying to deal with it as it comes. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. Life is Zoe. Zoe's abundant. Zoe's joy. It's in the power of the tongue. Your tongue controls your body. If you don't like what your face is doing, get your tongue talking in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you get some joy coming up. Life and death is in the power that blessings and curse. You need to I mean you're not speaking right. You're not talking right. And years ago I used to think, well, hey, I got good days and bad days. One day you listen to the radio this way, the other day you listen over here, you know. One day somebody's going, oh, and the by and by, and next one I got a tear in her beer, you know. They've lost their minds. <laughs> well, <laughs> and you're wondering why it's affecting your mood that way. Because you're feeding the wrong spirit. I'm sorry, I ain't mean to get on nobody. I'm just, the Holy Ghost is talking. But you need, your tongue controls your body. If you're looking in the mirror and you're facing, you've been saying the wrong stuff. You've been listening to the wrong things. You ain't been feeding the right spirit. And listen, maybe you'll say, maybe you've been doing all that. Maybe you just took a big hit. Sometimes you take big hits. I mean, they, the enemy hits so hard it knocks the breath out of you. Mm -hmm. And you got to grab yourself for a minute. But then you grab a hold of the Holy Ghost and you say, not today, devil. <laughs> not today. Well, maybe you're like me and maybe you're just human. And sometimes you lose your joy because you lost your temper. Now listen, I'm no raven lunatic blowing off the handle in what I call 
losing my temple and most people don't even call having a bad day anymore. It used to be that way. But let me tell you, if, I, if I, all the right things line up and I lose my temple, then I've stepped outside the temper, temper. I have stepped outside the temple. And now I've stepped outside the anointing. And now all my joy is getting sucked right out the window. And the devil's going, ha, 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 ha. And he ain't laughing away. He ain't, his, his, his laugh ain't no fun. But then I can go, Lord, forgive me. I can go back and make it right. And I can get better working on my face. And he goes, like, the guy said, I knew it all anyway. So let's go make it work on it. You know, the funnest thing you can do is work on your character. Seriously. I used to think it was the worst thing. But the funnest thing you can do is work on your character. Because the more you work on the character, the more joy you get. The more power of the Holy Ghost you get. The devil wants to tell you he wants you to shy away from working on your character. Like, Here we go again. Instead of going, here we go again. I'm about to get an increase in the Holy Ghost. I'm about to go to a new level. And there ain't no devil going to follow me. I hate that saying, new level, new devil. There may be new devils coming up. Listen, they can't keep up with the power of the Holy Ghost. But you need to keep, what happens is people get a new level and then they don't watch their face, they don't watch their countenance, and they get all the joy sucked right out and they get focused on all their problems and all the things the devil's doing instead of who God is and who God is in them. And they change their confession, they get their tongue wrapped up, and next thing you know they're walking around going, oh man, new level, new devil. It's been awesome, but man, really getting hit. I just want to go, shut up, stupid. You realize what you're saying? You're saying that that devil's bigger than God Almighty that made you, that spoke the world into existence. He put the, he, he, greater is he that's within you than he that is in the world. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Listen, I'm sitting here talking. Sometimes I got to look at the grass and say, listen, yeah, there's some things going on. I, I, you know what? I was speaking to my body. My body don't line up. When I'm in so much pain, you know, I, I've had to learn how to be happy in the middle of some of the worst pain I've ever felt. But I'm here to tell you, it's still possible. And I don't take no drugs, I don't take no pain pills, only I need is the power of the Holy Ghost. The doctor says I can't walk, I walk. So I can't do this, I do that. I don't have. I don't need no other trash from the enemy. But I'm here to tell you, I've learned that I could even have joy in the middle of the most, most worst pain under the sun. There was a season I thought, well, no, Lord, I... You expect me to be happy when I'm, I can't even function? I can't even think? And he said, I never said you couldn't think. I never said you couldn't function. Who told you that? Well, my body's telling me that. Well, who's the boss? You and me or your body? And you'll start changing how you're thinking. And you'll start getting happy. Now, sometimes, maybe you're like me and you're a human. You know, the enemy, he's really good, I know. He can get everything, all the situations, pain, all these, he'll get them, he'll get them, he really likes to try to accumulate them to one big explosion. Mm. But guess what, the Word of God's even bigger than that. And the good news is, I'm not, I'm not advocating for you to miss it, but if you miss it, there's, there's still anointing, there's still a blood that will wash you free, that'll get you right back in it, because God already seen it anyways. And if you'll learn from it, when the correction comes, you won't make the same mistake again. Or you'll be smarter and cut him off quicker. You know, sometimes I'm slow. You know, I, I, I'm married. I got four kids. Founded a church for. <laughs> so I found a church. Got married. Had four kids all at the same time. I mean, you could call me a glutton for punishment. I've <laughs> been in the ministry 25 years, and and but I've learned things. You know, if uh, th things are going here and this is putting off, I, I I've learned. You know what? You need to. Uh, I, if somebody's getting to me, even if I'm 100% right and what they're doing is 100% wrong, if it's getting to me, I'm the one that needs to go pray and spend time with God. Now, they may need deliverance, but that's between them and God. Are you all hearing, Pastor Todd? This is good. It's all free. Didn't, we didn't even took an offer now. <laughs> When people are happy, they smile. But when they are sad, they look depressed. Yeah. You walk up to somebody, you want to encourage them, you can tell they're struggling. You doing all right? I'm fine. Are you sure? Yes. Now, do you believe them and let them keep lying to you? Or you go, are you sure? Now, listen, maybe you're just not the person they're going to open up to. But you can sure pray for them. What 
time is to see here. 7.42. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on foolishness. A discerning mind seeks knowledge, but the mouth of fools feed on foolishness. An intelligent person is always eager to take in more truth. Fools feast on fast food, fads, and fantasies. Get rich schemes. Prosperity, gospel. Now, God wants you to prosper. You know, I've talked that around here. But, you know, there's people that only chase Jesus right now for the money. Yes, sir. All the other stuff they fall into. But intelligent people is always eager to take in more truth. You don't go, well, I've heard all of that. Thank you for sharing. Well, not here. The heart of him that hath understanding seeketh knowledge, but the mouth of fools feedeth on folly. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, but the mouths of fools feed on folly. The heart of the one who has understanding seeks knowledge. That means the more Jesus you have in you, the more you're going to seek the truth. The more knowledge of God you're going to see. You're not going to be satisfied knowing what you knew last week, the week before, the week before that. You're constantly going to want to go in deeper, breaking it down more, seeking the face of God. Fools, they go and find, they, they have itching ears. They want to hear what, they, what, what suits them, what fits them. They don't want to hear the truth. Intelligent people want to learn, but stupid people are satisfied with ignorance. Now, if I probably preach that on the air, I might get shut down. But I, I probably would preach it anyways if God told me. I know I would. But intelligent people want to learn. How many came tonight because you had nothing better to do? I mean, it's a social hangout, you know. You got the AC on. At least it's a good place to get there was some, You know, I've met people that came to church just because they had the church had good AC. They'd come once a week just to go and hang out to, you know, especially other people. They'll come chase boys, chase girls. Or they'll just come because they're assigned from the enemy just to cause havoc and chaos. And then there's people that come because they would have rather stayed. Listen, you know you can really tell when you're hungry for the truth? When you would have rather have stayed home and done something else and your body told you to do something else, but your spirit said you're not the boss. I'm going to church. I'm going to learn something. I know that pastor's watching out for my soul. I know he studied all week, and I know there's something there that I'm going to get tonight that I'm going to learn that's going to help make me a better man or woman of God. So I'm not going to miss get missed out. I'm not going to get cheated. I'm going to go. Stupid people, they stay home and turn on the TV, and whatever, whatever the person says, they start listening to and believe. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but the, that is of a merry heart hath a continual feast. All the days of the oppressed are miserable. Let me tell you, you go in so far at the enemy, you become oppressed and then possessed. When you when you get a bunch of open doors in your life, you become oppressed. And it will every pleasure, even no matter how good it feels, ends in misery. And you'll become a very miserable person. But a cheerful heart has a continual feast. Listen. Remember, you're in control of your heart. You get to decide. You get to speak to it. A miserable heart means a miserable life. If you've gotten a miserable life, that's a good sign you need a heart change. Take out the heart of stone, get a heart of flesh. A cheerful heart fills the day with song. You ever met those people that are morning people? I mean, they just wake up in the morning smiling, singing. You like you want to slap them, you know? <laughs> No, Frank was like, "Is he <laughs> No, I, when somebody's happy, I mean, you, ever, you, you know, when it used to be in the world before God started working on me that I was in charge. If it was a really perfect day, if something was just really going on, there was just a really good tune, I'd be singing and happy and 
Well, it's just, you know, everything's perfect. Don't let nothing happen to mess up my day. I want to tell you, you're in control of your day. Remember, with your blessings of tongue, blessings in life are in the power of the tongue, life and death. You can speak it, you can get it there. But I used to settle for it every once in a while, and I started realizing I had control, and I could have it more than once in a while. Because the devil comes to steal your joy, steal your peace, steal your hope. God said he can be may have it, have it more abundantly. So a cheerful heart fills the day with some. And if you start really believing the promises of God, they'll start bringing you hope in the darkest of circumstances. If you really believe that if God be for you, who can be against you, then the enemy's not going to be able to threaten you with your job, your boss, your house, every other thing under the sun. He can't. He won't. I mean, he'll try, but it won't have any effect on you. If he told you not to even worry about where you're going to live, what you're going to eat, you really start believing that he took care of the birds of the air, how much more is he going to take care of you, then all those fears will just fade away. And you'll be like, oh man, you should be really upset right now, but praise God's got me. I'm right where he wants me to be. God, there are only this many people came to church. Did you change your mind? He ain't changed his mind one bit about broken chains and the things he's got for us. And I'm just as happy today as when I've been when there were 60 here. Because there's people here, the people that here came here to listen, came to learn something. You know, you know what happened if a bunch of Christians actually started living this gospel the way God's intending it right here, the way he said, there'd be a whole world wanting to get saved. You know, there was a whole group of people in the uh, 1600s there was tons of places they could. They tried to get in to be missionaries. And back then, missionaries didn't get to go home every year or once a year. Once you got to be a missionary to a country, you left your family, you left your friends for all your lifetime. You went and lived at that place until you died. And you, you forsake everything you ever knew. And there was these ones called the Moravians. And they would sell themselves into slavery so that they could go and witness into certain countries. And they would... and. Uh, John Wesley, he had a great revival in America. And what moved him from mediocrity into fire was he was, on a, he was on a ship traveling back and there was a bunch of them on there that sold themselves. And he said they were in harsh conditions. He said when they were singing and worshiping God like he'd never seen and they were so happy. He said the more they were beat, the more they smiled and laughed. He said I was so convicted in my wretched soul and how I had said I love God and serve God. That I, he said that day I swore I would never be that way again, that I was going all in with God. And he did, and it radically even changed our nation. There was radical revivals up and down. Could you imagine being so sold out for God? He said, I want you to go here. We start thinking about having to give up this or give up that. They give up every family they know, sell themselves into slavery just so they can, just so they can witness. And they... That there's whole countries that are saved now because of these group, this group of people. And now some people said they were extremists. They shouldn't have done this. Listen, I, I, it's not for my job to say what God told them to do not to do, but I can tell you they love God. They didn't withhold anything. And I believe they learned what this is here, that a cheerful heart is a continual feast. They had, they had things to eat that no one could see. They feasted at God's table, I believe, every day. You ever, when you're fasting, had God just sustain your food? Could you imagine, no matter what the enemy did, during all these harsh conditions, they had everything they needed, and they were happy and content because God was sustaining them. All the days that afflicted are evil, but that is of a cheerful heart, have a continual feast. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but the cheerful of heart has a continual feast. All the days of the afflicted are wretched, but one who has a cheerful heart enjoys a continual feast. The life of, of the poor is a constant struggle, but happy people always enjoy life. Now listen, that's true. You ever met poor people that are always, you know, if you're poor, you're just always poor. Some of the richest people I ever know, ever knew didn't have very much, just like those slaves I was talking about. But they realized who their God was, they realized everything they had needed came in through God. And you couldn't shut them up. You couldn't beat them up. They just happened, you know. And as I started, I've studied all this uh, for many, many years. And I can tell you it's facts. I can give you all the books and references for it. But God challenged me because there was times when I'd get up and I'd be going through something. And, you know, the devil, the devil always makes you think you're the worm going through the hardest thing, whatever it is, you know. But as I, I faced that, I was like, you know, I could have a smile regardless. I could be full of joy regardless of what's coming. It's been my mission for the last little while. 
maybe it's one of the things I've been supposed to learn. I'm not out of the woods for it all yet, but uh, I can tell you I got a whole lot more smile now than what I had for a little while through. And I get to choose, you know. And yes, you can even be full of joy in the, when you're in the midst of pain, but the cool thing is if you stay full of joy, the pain ends up leaving too. But if you'll get bitter and you take the, take the bait, you'll just get more pain because the enemy, well, he, he's not going to stop till you're dead. So miserable heart means a miserable life. Does that sound like anything anybody wants? But if I was honest, I think almost everybody in this room has lived part of that life at least once. Does, does, that, does anybody want to go back to that old life? No. But how many realize that a cheerful heart fills you with song? How many wants to go so full of the Holy Ghost, so full of God, that you just start, you just singing, happy? It doesn't, you know, a lot of people say that Paul and Silas were singing so that God would set them free. I believe it was just they got to a place and I believe they were under extreme pressure. And I believe they realized when they got under extreme pressure, they had to tap into the things of God. So they started worshiping God. They started praising God. Not knowing what God was going to do, but knowing that God was a good God. And then boom, he set them free. But if they would have complained, they'd have still been there in them chains. And a lot of people in their chains, and they're still there, and they're saying they've tried God, but they've never really tried God. The enemy, the enemy's trying to convince them God isn't who He said He is, because they won't never get outside themselves and go all in with God. That's a whole other message. Glory. I think I'll wait there. The next one's talking about a simple life and the fear of the Lord. Good stuff. All right. Well, all right, I did. I get that after we take ours. Thank you for reminding me. Glory to God. All right, who wants to go first tonight? Sister Shawn. Um, the more you allow God to work on your character, the happier you're going to Amen. Good stuff. Sister Rebecca. You can't hide your thoughts from God. Amen. Good stuff. Oh, microphone. Yes, don't like it here. Thank you. You can have them again if you want. Okay. The more you allow God to work on your character, the happier you're going to get. Amen. Amen. Sister Rebecca. You can't hide your thoughts from God. Amen. All right. Who wants to go next? Sister Becky. Give it all to God. He already knows anyway. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Good stuff. All right. Next, Sister Heather. You're in control of your joy tank. Amen. You're in control of your joy tank. Somebody else. Brother Raymond. The more you uh, pray in the Spirit, the uh, happier you're going to be at the fast food for fools. <laughs> <laughs> fast foods for fools. I see a Facebook post coming there about being like, what? <laughs> you know, but you, you do think about that so many times that. I'm not knocking other churches or what they do and how they do what they do between God. So many times services a day, they've got them planned down to the minute. Get them in, get them out, have three or four services a day. Rotate it like cattle. I'm more interested to let the Holy Ghost have His way, what He wants to say, making sure the people hear what God wants to hear. And, uh, you know, I don't think God is the one you put on the timetable and say, well, he's a, I hear people say, well, He's a God of order. He's the one that established the sun and the moon. Yeah, He also made eclipses. So certain times he takes a pause. <laughs> they don't like talking to me very often. <laughs> Who wants to go next for Next. Brother John Reese. It's, uh, not just under the blood, but you can be truly free. Amen. Amen. Yes. We'll come back one more. We got we got two. 
Sister Deb's up. She was about to raise her hand. <laughs> when your heart is full of sorrow and your spirit is broken. Amen. Amen. Miss Rachel. <laughs> Glad I could be of service. Yeah. You're bitter, it will cause more pain. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Good stuff. Sister Rebecca, you had another one you wanted to share? When you pray in the Holy Ghost and tongues, you also pray the pain away. Amen. All right. Anybody else wants to go? Sister Heather. <laughs> Receive correction, you won't be a scoffer. Receive correction, you will not be a scoffer. Or stupid, or blocky, or a fool. <laughs> I went. <laughs> it's like you said before: correction is not rejection; it's direction. Amen. That sounds like a Holy Ghost quote. Yeah, that's good stuff. I, have to, I can pin that down. How am I going to take credit for the Holy Spirit? <laughs> Pastor Tammy, you haven't shared anything. Yeah, um, just a reminder, encourage yourself in the Lord, and sometimes you got to talk to yourself and talk to the mirror. Get yourself encouraged and build yourself with the Word and the Holy Ghost. Amen, yeah. amen. Yeah. And you're all going to find yourself someday, sometime, the, with the guy looking back at the mirror, looks like he's been eating on percentage. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to know, I need to have a Holy Ghost talk right now. What is a percentage? <laughs> well, I know what lemons are. It's not. It's a type of a fruit down south that uh, grows on a tree. And if they're ripe, and there's only like a week and a half window when they're ripe and not rotten, they actually taste pretty good. Other than that, they're the most sour thing you've ever put in your mouth. And a lot of people have mistaken when they're ripe for when they're not. And then they'll go ahead and suck on them and try to find convince them about their buddy next to them if they're good they're ready. Yeah. <laughs> and your face don't lie. <laughs> you look like you've been sucking on persimmons. <laughs> huh? I'll gladly bring y'all some. We go down home. Just make sure they're right. Just make sure they're right. Well, then you won't know what it looks like to be sucking on percentage. <laughs> I'll trust you. <laughs> Glory. Amen. We are going to turn it over. That's right. Yep. Would you get the offering plate since I forgot today? Well, hasn't it been good to be in the house of God? Amen. Amen. Do you all feel a little lighter? I'm so glad that God's not, I mean, I love worship and I love going in deep, but I'm so thankful that he can, he can move even right like we're having a Bible study, the presence of God. You come in one way, you leave another. Isn't that good news? The presence of the living God. I feel like I've deposited some joy in your spirit. Some of you are getting home later, you'll be going, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Some of you be sliding down the bedroom. Holy <laughs> God. <laughs> and Holy Glory said, Well, you asked for more. <laughs> you keep your kids sometimes, so you'll get so full of them, they'll go, What's so funny, Daddy? I don't know. <laughs> I just have to. What's that? Yeah, one time he couldn't stop laughing in the house, huh? Yeah, the anointing was strong. And that's out of the mouth of babes. You can't work that stuff up. Amen. You can't, uh, they don't even, you know, they wouldn't know how to, how to fake all that. Amen. Isn't that good? So thankful for y'all coming tonight. Uh, Tomorrow night is Overcomers. We'll be uh, on step one, lesson three. Is that correct, y'all? Yes. 
Yeah. Three three four. Four. What's that? Three or four. Three or four? Three or four. Uh, I've been I've been slow moving ahead on step one. When we uh have that it'll be good and then uh Sunday is potluck. So y'all bring something to eat. I am gonna bring a uh, smoked pulled pork myself. So if you don't like it, don't eat it. You'll know who made it. <laughs> if you don't, it's all. I don't think you'll like it. You might just. Yes, you will. Just send it back home. Coleslaw. I like it. Coleslaw. Need some coleslaw on it. All right. Yeah, but uh, it's going to be good. We're having a good time Sunday. I mean, y'all feel the joy of the Lord. Amen. I have my, I'm expecting some God to move Sunday, expecting Him to speak. And uh, then we have some vacations coming up uh, that the, the uh, I, I, I used, there's no easy way to say I was going to say the Gleason girls, but it's not the Gleason, not the Hall girls no more. But the, the Gleason Hall families, they're going to be vacating here on the soon, going on vacation. And so uh, and then we have some others that will be coming up. So summer's coming. I encourage you to take some time. If Jesus need to go to the beach and to the ocean, how much more do we? But I never encourage you to skip church, no matter where you go. Yeah. Amen. And uh, But they'll be coming up. And uh, sometime in August... Me and Pastor Tammy are looking to make the great escape again in the camper. <laughs> and uh, we're just trying to decide which part of the country to point it towards this year. And, but, and then we're going to have some snow cone Saturdays coming up. We, I have lots of things that I want to do. VBS. Yeah, VBS is coming up. We're going to start having some meetings on that. We could use all hands on deck with it. If you don't think you can help, you probably can. Just come see us. <laughs> you say you're not called to that, I'll tell you, just answer your phone. Then <laughs> 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 I mentioned I may be in rare form tonight. <laughs> but, uh, VBS is coming up, and then uh, some snow cone Saturdays, and then I have uh, we'll be having a movie night at my house sometime soon. Outside movie night, and bonfire, all those things. I've got a lot of other things in there. The thing is, like I got to do them when God tells me to. Otherwise, they're just events, and I've never been just an event having or just to have events because. That's too much work just to do a fleshly thing. But we're going to be doing, we got some great uh, fellowship times, some great community time coming up as a church. I mean, how I, I many know when we say BCC family, we mean it? And uh, so I, we're going to give opportunities to hang out together, have fun, and uh, lots of things coming up. So stay attached, stay tuned. And uh, I know, I think we're going to be going to Lake Shelbyville this year to the beach sometime too as a church again but if you look summer's already getting away from us and we've got all these things and then uh saturday the 29th what time are y'all meeting here so you're saying 6 30 then right Oh, okay. I couldn't, under, couldn't understand. You had your tongue in your mouth. Why did not say? We don't need to go to the bathroom. It's a bathroom. If she lines everybody up like the kids at the bathrooms, I want a picture. <laughs> so. So what time are you all meeting here? <laughs> well, we're going to leave at 7. 6.30. 6.30, yes. 
Six thirty ish. Does anybody know where you're going if you get here at 6 30? <laughs> to the bathroom. <laughs> to the bathroom. <laughs> Saturday night. <laughs> Emergency bathroom test. <laughs> Here. You're going to Arthur, Arthur, to watch the uh, to watch the Amish do burnouts. Let's get. <laughs> no, the Amish are going to do fireworks the old-fashioned way. Brother Raymond, would you would you like to regain some of this before I lose it up here? <laughs> tell us, tell us what they're going to see. I don't know about that. You're the only one that's been. Good time, but it's pretty amazing. You know, that's probably the best fireworks show I've ever seen. You know? well, that's saying so. I've seen some pretty good. I grew up on the Tennessee River, and they do them over the river. Uh, but like this is pretty. Bad. I ain't never seen nothing like this in my life. Alright. Pretty good. 40,000 people. Uh, 30, 30 to 40,000 people. Uh, so, now you have it. You get here early to go to the bathroom because you don't want to have a misstep when the fireworks go off. <laughs> don't want to hear about scaring nothing out of it. No, it's going to be a good time for those that are coming to be here for that uh, Sunday morning, bright and early, 10 o'clock if you got to pee. <laughs> 10, 10 30 if you're ready to go. We need a wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Joyce, did you hear that? I wasn't even paying attention. <laughs> That's probably a good thing. <laughs> they were talking about bringing a wheelbarrow for you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I didn't have nothing to do with it. For I don't the need that. <laughs> now you're going to get me hit on the way home. <laughs> Well, well, I love you all. See, listen, I told you. That joy is contagious, ain't it? Just, the Lord likes to have a good time. Come think about that would be fun, wouldn't it? Did she say on second thought, I want one? It'd be fun. I got a picture of you on a motorcycle now. I just need one on the wheel. You, yeah, the, 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 you all are dismissed. <laughs>